Welcome back to Retraced Echoes. As always, I'm your host. My name is Bert. Now we got something a little bit special for y'all today. For anyone that knows, obviously, I come out with a podcast once a week. We did a podcast on this channel. Oh, goodness. It's probably been about a month uh, and a half, maybe, maybe two months. Uh, and I did it around what most of you will know as the Hinsdale House. I like to refer to it now as the Dandy House. Thanks to a close friend of mine. His name is Paul. Uh, Paul's going to be with us today. This is going to be the interview section of what my typical podcast is. So it's a very special to give you guys an idea. I've had two interviews that's been lined up that has happened around the same time as Paul. I decided I wanted Paul's interview to be first. Made that decision a long time ago. So I've kind of been waiting for this moment to bring you the actual story of what I would like to refer to as the dandy house. Now to give you a little bit of an idea Paul does have a book that is out. I would advise everyone to check this out. You can find it on Amazon and the description down below. I'm going to leave a link for this book so it's easy for you guys to find. It's a a book that I wish I could say I've had enough time to read this much. I've had the book now for probably about uh, two weeks, three weeks, something like that. And I've made it, uh, I think, 50 pages. (laughs) (laughs) But luckily, I know Paul pretty well. Some people like some information out. Some people does not like information out. So a lot of times I let people kind of give an idea of what they do and what info they want out so they can find you and kind of know who you are, Paul. Well, I'm out there. (laughs) You run the YouTube channel, the Dandy House. Yes, it's actually called the Real Dandy House. I had to do that because there were a couple other Dandy Houses on on YouTube, but not of of the house. One's a restaurant, one's a... uh, an Asian bathhouse or something. And I, I don't want to be confused with those, but uh, the real dandy house, if you type that in the search, you'll get it. You'll get it that way. And we'll put it down in the description down below too. That way everyone kind of knows where they'll find everything. Alrighty. But what do you want me to tell you? What, what do you want to know that you, you don't already now know? <laughs> well, I know everything It's going to be my viewers that, that doesn't know you as well as I know you, Paul. Now I've been corresponding back and forth with you actually not long after the Dandy House came out, and you, I've been fortunate enough to to grow a friendship with Paul. He's kind of gave me an idea of some of the places that I wish I could say. Which obviously you guys are probably going to go back and try to find the first episode. I took that down because there were some errors. We're this is why we're doing this. We're correcting some of those errors. Now part two. I feel pretty confident that that one's correct. I found an interview that Dan, who's the current owner of the the residence, he provided that interview. So I'm 95% sure that one's pretty accurate, but it's the first yeah, one we're was. taking down. Yeah, so we're well, we're definitely going to do this one right. You know, I, 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 I scour YouTube all the time about the Dandy House, about the Hinsdale House. It's more known now as the, the Hinsdale House because that's the name that Dan, the owner, uh, uses on on everything, but I I check YouTube videos out to see who's telling what, and we've talked about this that there's very little real information about the house. I mean, true facts about the house. I now I can say I'm an expert because I was there during the exorcism in 1974. I met the family in '73. I was there for a year and a half with them as a friend. And um, so I've experienced everything that they've experienced. And I know what what is fake, what is folklore, what is embellished. And what you find on YouTube videos from different groups that go to the house, a lot of it is just the story that someone told 10 years ago. And it continues to be told. And it's it's misinformation. Very much so. When I saw Bert's first episode of The Dandy House, I wasn't mad because I, some people I do get mad at, and I I won't mention names, although at most, most of the time I do mention names, but I won't mention (laughs) names. Uh, I wasn't mad with Bert. I was upset with what he was telling, but it's not his fault. And I was a little bit kind of overbearing with explaining to him, you know, you got this wrong, you got that wrong. Uh, But I wasn't the typical me that would have bombarded him with what the hell's wrong with you? Where did you get your information? 
I think the biggest reason I didn't uh, act that way is because I could see in Bert that he really loves his job and he does a hell of a job doing it. So I, I just said what I said, which was kind of minor, but I apologized immediately in the next comment after he commented to me to kind of point out, and he didn't say this, but to point out just how much of an ass I was being. So <laughs> bully for Bert, I appreciated that. And it makes me look at other people's videos a whole lot differently too, because it's not their fault with the information they give. You want the true story about the dandy house? There's two people that can tell you the real happenings, me and Clara Miller, who is still alive at the age of 86. Yeah, and th that's the funny thing. You know, when a lot of times when we try to research these channels, and I can only speak for myself, having dealt with some of the things that I've dealt with, just in the research myself, trying to figure out exactly how to present a story, where the story goes. I'll, I even go as far as trying to find blueprints to the residents, which, as most people know, it's very hard to find blueprints. I've only found there one set are. of blueprints <laughs> in all the episodes I've done, one set, and believe it or not, it was for the Sally house. Of all the residents, that's the only one. Gosh, um, almighty. But, you know, I went to bigger channels because I could not find an interview with the exception of a haunting uh, mm. that had Clara in it. But right. the amazing thing is when you look at research and I've got to give some people some credit and there's some people that I got to look back and go, you know what? You, you could have done this a little bit better. It becomes difficult because in a case like this one, there's so many amazing stories but most of them are what I call ho holly weirded. <laughs> you know yeah. So they're yeah, not even yeah. true, but they look great for a story, which they obviously do. I, I want to bring you into the mix on this a little bit, Paul. Obviously, I've heard you. And again, I got to remember, I've heard a lot of the stories and I've seen some things on your channel myself personally. Can you go through the very beginning, how you even came to the point to where you met Clara and what started this whole chain of events to occur? Because you had a small business of, of your own, correct? Yep. Uh, my 21st birthday, I bought a house and I bought my first business. And that business was an old soda bar, which was from the, the building was built in the 1880s. And it was all marble and it was just beautiful inside. And, and uh, I bought it from the second owner, Hank Kays, and it was called the Fountain of Youth. Well, I'm, I'm in there doing my thing. And suddenly the, the fire department's pulling up out front. I did smell smoke. And the adjacent building, actually, they were connected. There was a fire in the wall of the barber shop, And they came in and checked my basement and checked everything in between. Make sure the small fire was out. And uh, as they're in the basement, they saw that the wires needed to be re removed replaced because it's the old cloth wiring and there was telephone wire used for electrical current uh to a couple of things in the basement so they said you can't you can't be open we're gonna we're gonna condemn the building until the wiring's redone well that was a hell of a blow after three months in business and the newspaper came in the boy the newspaper boy came in and, and on the front page of the paper was a haunted house in Hinsdale, New York. I thought, well, that's interesting. I put the paper down and I figured I'd read it later. I wasn't interested in haunted things at the time. And uh, I called my fiance to let her know what happened. And I heard all these women just chattering in the background. I said, is there something wrong there? What's all of the ruckus? She said, well, you mentioned, I did mention the story of the haunted house to her. She said, just so happens I work with the mom from that house. I said, you gotta be kidding me. Ask her if we can come up because I need a hell of a good laugh right now. So we went up that night, just a regular house, you know, out in the country, isolated, no one else around, no other houses, neighbor, quarter mile away was the closest neighbor. And uh, that's when it all began for me, the experience. I was thrown into the paranormal in that little quiet farmhouse, which turned out to not be too quiet anymore. 
And that was 51 years ago this August, August 17th. Yeah, I, 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 there's a wow factor there because I can't believe I'm still involved with that place. I was in Arizona for 25 years. I left in 75 after the dandies left their house. My mother had passed away and I said, and, and my son was born premature. So we had to get out of New York to weather the doctor. Uh, suggested a, a drier climate. And my godfather lived in Arizona, so that's where we went. And I came back in 99, and I was at that house within three hours. Three hours, because this house calls you. Not that I'm saying I went up that day because it called me, but it calls you all the time. And I, I'm a skeptic. Everybody needs to know that. I don't believe in everything that goes bump in the night. But I will tell you, this house is truly screwed up bad. But 90% of the time, I love it. Now, with your skepticism, obviously, understanding that you are a skeptic, that's probably one of the most fascinating things about you that I've learned. Because I, I love to call myself a skeptic. You're more skeptical than I am. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> But from a skeptic's point of view, obviously you went into this haunting assuming that it's going to be a case where it's more of, I would assume, based on what you've said, as being kind of like a, this will be a good laugh kind of perspective. That's what I was looking for. Really? Yeah, that's what I thought. And when you got there, did, did anything happen as soon as you got there? Only one, well, two things that happened. Well, three things if you want to go to the minor side. We heard furniture dragging upstairs. When we were in the living room, we were all chatting, getting to know each other. And uh, Clara said, here we go. And I thought, here we go what? And she's looking at the, the ceiling. And she said, there's nobody up there. I said, there's nobody upstairs. And it sounded like a chair or maybe a, a small table was going across the room. You could, you could, you know, watch it go. And then Phil, who also, the dad, was a skeptic. From what I understand, he didn't believe. But actually, Clara explained to me he did believe, but did not want to give in. He didn't want his family to be going through this hell they were going through and him jumping in and going through it too. So he just tried to find a reasonable explanation of what was happening. He took me on a tour of the house, which is very small. It's, it's five bedrooms. But it's dinky. It's a thousand square feet. If you can imagine that. There are no closets in any bedroom but one. And uh, we got walking around and then he said, let's go out back. And where the name of my book came from is the middle daughter, Laura. As we're walking out the door, she's at the sink with her sister, Mary, doing dishes. And she looked at me in a quizzical way and said, you know, they're here too, don't you? She was 13 at the time. I'm thinking, I don't know anything, little girl, but see you later. So Phil and I went outside, was just getting pretty close to dark, dark. And up there, when there's no moonlight and it's dark out, you're not going to see your friend three feet from you. It's pitch black in those hills. We're walking out toward the pond, and I don't know why he was taking me out there. But as we're walking, he said, do you feel those cold spots? And I'm thinking, yeah, we're in the country and we are by water. You know, you're going to have those pockets of fresh, cool air that comes off the water. And we got toward the back of the pond and he turned around and I'm holding on to his shirt, his shirt tail, because I was scared. I was 22, 21 years old at the time. And um, just before we got to the beginning of the pond, which isn't really that big, I said, is this where you saw the, the excuse me, the dizzy B word, which that's what he called the woman that danced around the pond. And he spun around as quick as he could, put that flashlight right next to my eyes. I thought he was going to hit me with it. And said he didn't, he screamed. He didn't ask to see the so-and-so woman. That was the, the, the dresser or whatever moving upstairs was item number one. Okay, so you tell me there's nobody up there, which I didn't believe her, to be honest with you. And then uh, him getting angry, 
We go back around the side of the house to check on Clara's brother, who was standing vigil at the end of the driveway with a shot, well, with a 22 rifle, which pointed at my head when I pulled up. Um, checked on him, a lot of trespassers. Everybody wanted to see uh, a, a, a little proof of life after death. And as we walked back to the house, just as we uh, rounded the corner, we walked through a cold spot that was like a deep freeze in a, in a supermarket. And he, he turned around and he said, you feel that cold spot, don't you? And what I, I, I shook my head and said, yeah. And what I was thinking was, it was feeling me. Because I could feel it like it was engulfing me. I didn't, I wasn't walking through cold air. It was almost like it was holding on to me. So that be that. That's two things that seemed a little bit out of the ordinary. Uh, we stayed a little while. We left. We we thanked them for letting us come up. Matter of fact, I, I brought a I brought a box of all the extra potato chips I had, the individual bags, as a a I guess a warming gift, you know, for us trespassing up there and coming up. Uh, Debbie and Claire were, were quite friendly, but as we left, there's a reported hanging tree at the very beginning of their road, which is about, I want to say, and I should know this, about an eighth of a mile away. We got to the tree. My car had 24,000 miles on it. It was a new car. 20, 28,000, I think it was. We, we got even with that tree and the car stopped. Just stalled. So I, you know, I put it in, but the lights, everything went out, everything, pitch black. I put it in park, I turned the key, not even a click, like when you have a dead battery, nothing, just dead. Well, she's freaking out. Debbie's freaking out next to me because of all the stories and all the stories that we heard about people with car trouble coming up that road. You know, I'm thinking, well, you know, a ghost ain't gonna stop my car. It's a new car, get out of here. And I see the house in front of us, which is up on the hill. And I'm thinking of walking over there and say, you know, calling Claire and say, we need help down here at the bottom of the hill. And I thought, no, I'm not walking out here in the dark because it's black. And then Debbie's screaming. She screams. I, there's somebody standing in the tree, the hanging tree. And I'm thinking, I told her, don't you lose your cool now. Be calm. Everything's fine. There's nobody in the tree. And we're sitting there wondering, what the heck are we going to do? And uh, all of a sudden, a glint comes on my dashboard, a light just flickered, real kind of bright. And we both jump, and I'm thinking, oh, God, what's going on? We just came from a haunted house, and now things are coming after us. And it went away just for a second. And then it came on again and lasted longer and then went down a little bit, like, like it was moving then I realized it was a car coming down the road from way up on top. And it turned out to be Father Al, who was a friend of the family, who was called in because of all the paranormal experience. And when he pulled up behind us, I opened my door. I went out and instead of saying anything to him, I grabbed him. That's how scared I truly was and didn't realize it till I saw him. And he's a quiet spoken little man. He says, oh, what? What, what's, what's wrong? Car trouble? What's, what's going on? And I got in the car and I turned the key. I still had the door open. I turned the key. It started right up. Did Father Al intervene from whatever stopped my car? I took the car to Joe Zemer's gas station. He went over the entire thing. He said, there isn't a damn, he said, well, your car is brand new. There's nothing wrong with it. I said, this is what happened, Joe. He said, I, I can't find nothing. No shorts, no bad fuses, nothing. And nothing so, happened after that with the car? No, not again, thank God. No, at least not to the car, but I mean, my car rode beautifully. That's insane. Now I know, obviously you said once you got to the residence and you acknowledged the fact that she had looked up and had mentioned that there was furniture moving and that no one was up there. Mm -hmm. You said that you were still skeptical at that point of view. Was it that you couldn't hear it or you didn't believe that someone was not upstairs? Oh, I could hear it. it yeah, well, yeah, I could hear it. It was loud. It, 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 just like if, you know, if you're upstairs and you're dry, it's a wood floor, so you're going to hear it. And uh, my skepticism was that, are, are they making a story up? Because that's the first thing I thought. You know, a family, 
out the country, but I mean, they had just bought the house in 1970. And uh, so this is three years later. And are they making a story up? I mean, I'm going to be skeptical because I don't believe, I do believe in the spirit world. I do always have. I've been a weird person since I was a little boy. I always know when something's going to happen, but I don't know what that something is. I get what I used to call goosies. So occasionally something is about to happen and I'm thinking, okay, what's going to happen? I feel it coming and then somebody dies. I, I, I don't know what it is. I wish I did. That would be a, that would, that's being psychic. I'm not psychic. Um, so what happened, and this is the weirdest part, the very next day, I worked part-time at a sub shop with a friend of mine, Tim. He worked there too. We're working the next day and I'm telling him about this house and everything. He said, oh, I want to go, I want to go, I want to go. So we uh, we went, We, you know, I asked Debbie, can I go up? She said, I don't care, go ahead. And we went up to the house and all the way, do they have any daughters? He's a, he was a class clown, he really was. Yeah. He was the life of a Barty, goofy guy. And uh, I said, yeah, they, they got three daughters. Oh my God, are they pretty? I said, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I've seen them, but I, I didn't pay attention. I'm, Geez, what do I know? Well, Beth was 16 at the time, and he liked her. Tim was 18, and you know, he liked her. And they started talking and stuff, and they're still married today, by the way. They ended up courting and getting married, moving away, he was in the Air Force, and uh, they won't talk about the house. But Tim and I went up every night, every night, except when I was in a rock band, if my band was playing, which it usually was on weekends, we didn't go. But we were at the house every night. And I know that sounds bad because I've got a fiance at home. But she wanted me to help Clara and her family, which we were doing. Because people were trespassing every single day and night. It's just walking through the fields up there. There's a huge field before you get to the house. And there's people walking through it like they're, you know, I don't know what the heck they're looking for. But that went on for a year and a half until they until they ultimately moved because it got bad. Um, I, I don't want to tell the whole story because I would be sitting here until you had the same color hair that I do. Uh, <laughs> sure. And I've told the story 6,000 times. Probably more than that. Now, out of curiosity, when it comes to you know, they've been there for, you said at that point, three years that you met them. Was it instantaneous as soon as they moved in that these occurrences was happening? Not well, when they first moved in the house was full of flies and bees, just full, which, okay, you're in a country, you're going to have flies, you're going to have bees. And there was a beehive in the house, in the wall of the house. So that, that adds up. But that house has flies in it year round, and I mean sometimes an infestation, when it's 10 degrees below zero outside, flies don't fly. You go into Mary's room, constantly the window is covered with flies. I I can't figure that out. And I I don't know if I correlate infestation of flies and and demons as they say. I I don't I don't know, you know. But the house is nuts. Bert, it's nuts, and I hope you do get to come here, because I'll be your tour guide. <laughs> Myself and my co-host for the Deceptive Reality Podcast, what we're looking to do is eventually, we talk about towards the end of this year, that's kind of the goal, the, the frame of mind that we're trying to piece together, because he comes from Canada, significantly closer for me, I'm just in Ohio, I could make a day trip and be yeah. there. Uh, but his is a little bit more complex, obviously. Oh, so yeah, that's sure. our goal. So we want to come there. We're going to pay the money. We're going to see if we can come a little early so we can get some B-roll material with the residents and stuff like that. For anyone that doesn't know out there in podcast land, uh, B-roll material is the stuff you see in between the shots of us talking and doing the investigation. But we want to take the entire investigation and put it up on the website with every camera, every audio. So obviously we'll create an edited version of what we find. But our goal is to take that edited content and then say, if you hear a bump or you hear something that 
we think is there. You can go listen to the original audio that's not doctored by us. So you can say, yeah, there's something there. No, there's not. That's the goal. Um, but we're definitely looking forward to it. I know when I was doing the research myself personally, one of the things that I acknowledged was the fact that they had talked about the bees and the flies. They said that the exterminator came in and he kind of mentioned the same thing you did as far as this isn't supposed to be here. It's fall. Typically this stuff dies down quite a bit. Yeah. And it said that they couldn't even move in on day one because the exterminator had to take no. care of that. Is that true or is that false? Yes. Yeah. They, they, they did. They had to take care of it and clean the house. And, and uh, I, I don't think he removed the hive that was in the hive wasn't all that big. And it's always been in the same place all the time. Dan finally took care of it all these years later. But when he did, the whole, not the whole, a third of Mary's floor under the baseboards, under the, the floorboards, was a beehive. So I think it was like six feet by, oh my God, it was humongous. And the exterminator, well, he didn't exterminate them, he moved them. Um, he said that there were probably between 300 to 500,000 bees in that hive. And that, that's just, that's just great. Matter of fact, we would go downstairs in Beth's bedroom off the living room, hit the wall once, and all you could hear is a buzzing. They filled in the wall, they filled in the floor, and it, you could feel it. You could feel the, the vibration of all those bees with your hands on the wall. And that's not normal. It's not normal. I mean, they do infest these houses and, you know, dwellings all the time, but there was just something. I mean, why are there flies in there when it's freezing cold out for, you know, for months during the winter? But they're always there. They do talk about that in some of the hauntings. I'm kind of like you. I don't necessarily understand the logic behind it. I don't do hear about it. Um, another thing that I was looking at when I was looking at the original research that I could find, and again, you don't ever know what's truly true and what's truly false. Uh, one of the things that they talked about was that one of the daughters, I can't remember which one, and heck, who knows if he even got the name right on it, but one of the daughters, they said, had even zoned out looking into a mirror. Supposedly, Beth. I believe it was... Clara and uh, and Phil, they decided they was going to have their own night together and just kind of watch movies there. And my understanding is, is the kids were supposed to be gone that evening and they mm -hmm. were just kind of watching the movie in the house and something took them outside, which according to the story I heard was raccoons. They yeah, that's kind of felt good. Because they were like, well, thank goodness, you know, it's just coons, it's nothing else. You know what I'm saying? They start going back in, and they said that there's a girl that walked in front of the window or something, and then when they uh -huh. went inside the house, they went up to the room, and can you explain what happened there, what truly happened there, versus the story I gave is not correct. Beth, Beth did, uh, she a couple of times zoned out. Look, well, one time in particular, look in her, in her mirror. And you're, I know you're referring to the, the show A Haunting Dark Forest because that was in there. But of course, they manipulated it to make it more, more their story than the true story. Claire was furious with them when it aired uh, because they didn't tell the truth, which is normal. You know, they're going to, if I could just inter in intersect here. Mary Ann Winkowski, who is the original Ghost Whisperer, the Ghost Whisperer TV show, she was a, a consultant on that show talking about her, her ability to talk to spirits in full-blown conversations. It's the same thing with this, The Haunting. They should have had, they interviewed Clara. They interviewed Randy Carr and they interviewed Clara's son, Mike. And even after the interviews, they still botched it. They still screwed it up. There were four children in the family and they only had two in the show because for one thing, they didn't have to pay four actors. I hate to say that, but that was that main reason there. I did get that information uh, to be sure, but Beth did zone out. And I think I talked to it on my channel one night, uh, you were there. She actually zoned out in the, in the kitchen and the bathroom, like she was kneading dough and her eyes were black. 
her eyes were black. How, how does that happen? Skepticism, yet the stuff that's happened to me up there tells me you can't be a skeptic, you idiot. You've got to believe, which I do believe. But some things are just so hard to swallow. Even when you, you're a witness to it, Bert, some things that you witness Maybe it's so shocking your your mind doesn't want you to believe it. I don't know. But yeah, she she's owned out twice. Obviously, I want to tell that story on my podcast and provide the correct narration because I think that's such a an interesting story as far as them leaving and stuff. Can can you tell me exactly what happened? Because I think that's a great segue for that story of my podcast as far as the night that Clara and Phil had a movie night. Was that the same night that she supposedly zoned out or did they just clump two things completely together? They clumped them together because they were gotcha. having, I mean, this this happened when everybody was there. Uh, except Phil, Phil was at work in Buffalo. And I think, let me think, let me think. There was Mike, there was Beth, Mary, Laura, Clara, myself, I don't know what the hell I was doing there that night, but I remember this particular <laughs> night. Um, and you saw her and, with the black eyes. Did you see your yeah. eyes that was black? Wow, I, okay, I thought you heard. I caught a glimpse. I didn't see him the way they showed in the show that they depicted. Uh, I didn't see when she went to the hospital, when she was zoned out, and the doctor said her eyes changed color, but it wasn't black. I And I'll verify this with Claire, but I believe it went from blue to brown. And the doctors look at her and say, how am I seeing this? This is not even possible. The iris of the eye can't change colors. It can't, they can't do that, but they did. The doctor was in shock. How did you guys figure out that she was zoned out? How did she even figure that part out? Just basically the way she was acting, staring straight ahead, not answering anybody. Clara was more worried she was having some type of internal seizure other than, you know, like a, a, a physical shaking uh, seizure, but maybe a, something with her brain. Didn't seem right. Now, did she come out of it before she went to the hospital or did she go to the hospital and then come out of it? Not until and she came out and she was fine. And she was fine from that time on. Did she understand what happened? No. So is that uh, a, was that a simple act of possession? Yeah. That's what we all thought. That's what we all talked about. I wouldn't buy it, of course. Um, I think back on it now, and I suppose it's a possibility with what I have experienced up there. Because some of the things I've experienced up there, I would tell anybody else they're blowing smoke, tell them, telling that type of a story. You know, there was an interesting podcast that I did a while back. Um, and there was a lady, and again, you know, there's going to be stories that some people believe and some stories that people will not believe. But the story that I had told, which I found it within an interview, and I'm trying to remember which one it was to be for sure. I think it was the, um, you know what? I can't remember now. It was one of the podcasts that I did. It may have been the Allen House but it was um the woman said that she she also zoned out and they also i believe said that her eyes changed colors and the way she explained it was it was like she was asleep she didn't even acknowledge the fact she couldn't remember anything that happened before but it makes you wonder i don't necessarily know that a lot of times i think a, a lot of people want to go straight to possession because it is the most entertaining or the most you know, validation wise, but sometimes I wonder, and my co-host and I, we oftentimes talk about this on our podcast. I believe, and I'm not saying I'm right, but I believe that there is two dimensional planes. There's our dimensional plane and there's a spiritual dimensional plane. And I think sometimes they will intercept each other. And I believe that's how sometimes things will come in. Now, a lot of times when they talk about you know, things such as fault lines or water underneath properties, how 
Sometimes that can increase activity or if there's gyms underneath the property or uh, prime example, you know, they talk about uh, in the UK, there's so many fault lines and they believe that's why there's so many hauntings that occur in the UK. I don't necessarily doubt that, but I think that does something with the dimensional plane as well. My thought process is so sometimes I get curious if someone merges over into that dimensional plane, maybe for them they are somewhere they're asleep or something of that equivalent where in reality they're just stuck in limbo is what i think sometimes now do i believe that a demonic presence could potentially zone into that and use that i think it's possible but i always get scared saying demonic possession because that's such a weird realm to be in i don't i get scared sometimes especially if there's family still around like i'd be ticked if someone be like uh, your grandma was possessed. I'd be like, you're crazy. <laughs> so, so for the sake of Claire, we're just going to say she went somewhere else for a little bit. <laughs> I, uh, it, it, you know, if it weren't for Father Alphonsus, uh, I, I wouldn't have the open mind that I do now. He taught theology. He was a professor at St. Bonaventure University. He's the one that performed the exorcism simple exorcism house cleansing but he he deemed it an exorcism he didn't need permission from the church when the few conversations that i had with him kind of lightened my my thoughts as to not believing in demons because i told him i don't believe in demons he said and i was raised catholic and uh he said how can you not believe that god would cast out angels who were were bad at all times and, and they become demons. I, I said, this doesn't make sense. I thought God was all forgiving. And, you know, maybe put somebody in the, in the outhouse for a while or something, but why would they make him, why would he make him a demon? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm on the fence there with that, but I, I've been told by by people that supposedly know there are no experts. I'm sorry. Yeah. If somebody tells them they're an expert about paranormal as a whole, psychic phenomenon as a whole, now they may be well versed on different things uh, that in textbooks add up with all of the same opinions being given. And they might say, well, this is why, because there's 33,000 people believe this, but only four that believe this. If that's the way the experts work, they should go out of business. Because I, I think the only true experts are is somebody who dies and stays dead for a while, not for an hour, gets to know everybody over there, comes back and tells us or what they experienced while being in the afterlife. I know that's kind of far-fetched too, but... Um, I never believed in spirits being able to touch you, physically touch you to where you say, whoa, what was that? Because you see it in almost every YouTube video. They're always being touched, scratched, pinched, shoved, poked. And I never... Door slammed? It's, yeah, well, that's okay. I don't mind that. Let them slam the door. But the, the yeah. physical stuff, because I was always into the understanding... They can't hurt you because God wouldn't let that happen. Okay, we'll bring religion in for a second, but um, they can hurt you and they can hurt you bad. Now, whether that's a, a, a miserable SOB from the, in the afterlife that was the same when they were alive, or is it demonic? I can tell you right now that Tony Sparrow, Ed and Lorraine's uh, son-in-law told me that what happened to me was demonic and I told him he was full of you know what he said why do you say that he said I've been more involved with this stuff I said why because your mother-in-law was doing what she was doing with her husband I guess I'm confused he said that yours was demonic why because it was so powerful because it was so extremely powerful you know people get you will get touched and get scratched but when you almost get knocked out by air and everybody's standing there witnessing you just go flying when you get hit by nothing yeah i'm taking you right up to the big one bird i'm taking you right up to the big incident that happened to me it doesn't make sense 
And to this day, I won't say I deny it happened, but I deny my believing that something like that can happen from the spirit world, demonic or not. So for the listeners that that doesn't know exactly what you're what you're talking about, can you can you tell us what that story was? What exactly happened? It was myself, Tina, my friend, which is Sophia's grandmother. You can't see Sophia. She's whistling, but she's off camera, which is where she belongs. Uh, my friend Tina, her daughter, uh, Angel, her son, Nick, and a friend of ours, a, a pretty good-sized guy. We went up to the house one night. Flo and Joe Mizdick, who lived there at the time, were still in the house. And this was the, my early coming back to New York and meeting Tina and uh, her interest in the house. And I was standing, Angel, Jeff, and I were outside the, the van, and I was standing at Angel's, or uh, Tina's window, just cussing at the house, saying it's dead. You know, there's nothing here anymore. It's not like the Dandy family, what they went through. I said, this is a dead cell. There's nothing here. And suddenly, Jeff was standing behind me. Suddenly, I got shoved, but I didn't feel this. I didn't feel a physical touch. There was no touch. And I got shoved, my head went into his teeth, he bit my head, and I ran back into the, into the van like a little sissy. I was scared to death. So I started thinking, did he reach around in front of me and push me or something? But he didn't, you know, I, I, we, we added everything up, but there's no way he could have. So we sat, we all got ran back into the van Tina's in the driver's seat, and I, I, after about 15 minutes, I got angry. I said, that, that can't happen. You know that can't happen. So I got back out, and I'm leaning on her window, open window, with my right arm, and I'm facing the house, yelling at it again, saying, oh, you're so tough. And I'm thinking, why am I saying these things? You're so tough. There's nothing here. And I said it several times, and I said, do it again. Go ahead. And I'm talking to Tina, I turn, talk to her, talk to the house, talk to her. And as I turned around, I think maybe the 10th time or whatever, I got punched, Bert. I got punched. Now I taught karate 14 years with the Young Olympians in Arizona. You can punch me all you want. I'm gonna take it and give it back. Whatever punched me, Jeff said it looked like that from my body position, I actually left the ground, I went up. Now I got punched here in this, I was facing that way. I got punched here. And when I did it, he said, it looked like you went up, which I don't know, maybe it was me just jumping, but I ripped the van, the mirror right off the van from the, the force of me flying that way, which is about two feet, which isn't that much. We didn't go back to that house for several weeks. I was scared I to death. I wouldn't have either. There's no way. But what what is what is possible? How 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 can a demon even? I mean, you watch the movie The Exorcism. It's supposed to be about you know a young boy, really, that it, the true story. But um, if it's demonic, if it's a, a miserable spirit, are, do they really have that power? Yeah, that's biblical. Yeah, hey, I know. I I know. I go. I I read the Bible. I do. A prime example for anyone that's out there in podcast land, you know, I, I typically don't do a lot of religious stuff because I know there's a lot of people 50-50. To give you a l- little bit of an idea of my background, you know, I came, I grew up in a very religious household. That's why a lot of times it's tough for people like me because, you know, we struggle with the, we're not really supposed to dabble in this world and X, Y, and Z, but curiosity for me has kind of grown me into this. I even did some studying of some demonology back in the day, but uh, one of the interesting stories that come from the Bible, if if anyone thinks about it, is the story of Job is probably the best example of that. Now, Satan took everything away from Job, but every single time he would have to go to God and say, what am I allowed to do? And God said, you can do everything with the exception of one thing, and that is to kill Job. Now, there was a interview that I watched probably, oh goodness, a couple weeks back, and it was with an ex-satanic. Um, he was like a wizard, I believe is what they call it on that realm. But the way he explained it was there is uh, spells that are cast, 
using magic, M-A-G-I-K, or C-K, it's one of the two deviations, um, or there is a hex. Now, with a spell, if someone casts a spell from a satanic side, that is basically a demon going to that person. If the person is quote unquote clean, the demon has no power and it just leaves. If it's a hex, which is significantly different and it requires a whole lot more on their side, and by a lot more, I mean it's blood. It's blood on their hands at that point. If there's that, then the demon will stay there until the person is unclean. Now, supposedly, that's up to death. So if God allows death to occur, that person could technically be killed by a demon. I keep hearing people go, well, a demon can't do anything because God won't allow it. What's being said is God has to be the one that will accept or not accept whatever happens within that realm. But if you look at the story of Job, that's a prime example of if God wills it okay, anything can happen. Hmm. That's very interesting. Scary, too. <laughs> but again, I have no clue. Yeah, it's scary. That That's a thing. Like, I don't know. I can, and a lot of people goes, well, how do you know X, Y, and Z? I don't. What I do is I base information based on what I hear. And that's why I think uh, everyone goes, why in the world would you study demonology? It's because if it exists, I want to understand what it is because if I have a good understanding, the worst thing you can ever do is go into something with zero understanding and they get caught off guard and they get stuck. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people and this in the same realm, they go, well, how can you be religious and still look at all these different things? And it's because for me, let's be honest, we all have things we deal with. If a demon came to me, I'm unclean. I'm in, <laughs> I'm in trouble, but I want to understand what that realm is so I can help get myself there so whether any of that is true but again i do look at the bible and i go that story's true you know that did happen so if it happened then who's to say that it can't happen now no it's yeah it's very true but it's definitely interesting to look at now i know that family my understanding is randy was the friend uh-huh. of mike which is the son correct mm-hmm Clara used to consider him her ghost chaser because many times when Randy came to the house, things just stopped. And they did. Uh, Randy was, how old was he? Seven? Uh, he was the same age as Mike. But he was, he had something about him. I had him on my show. He, we're still friends. He had some kind of humbo jumbo thing he could do with his mind or whatever and go into a a somewhat of a trance. And when he did, he had the strength of 10 people. I don't, again, I don't profess to know anything about what goes on with some of these things that happen. But yeah, he was, he was Mike's friend and I miss Mike. Now there was a story and I don't know where I got this story from. I don't, I don't think it was a haunting. It may have been, I can't remember, but Uh, There was a story supposedly that Mike and Randy had left. They went over to Randy's house, I believe. And this was obvious. Oh, you know what? I think it was in a haunting because it talked about the daughter being in that trance. Yep. And he just happened to call. And so obviously that could have all been, who knows what's true, right? They obviously embellished a lot of stuff, but they lump things together there, Bert. They, they lump things together. The, uh, Mike and Randy going away and the, the going into their trance type uh, predicament and they just kind of cut it short, you know, cut to the chase. And, and they had so many things wrong. First of all, look at the house. You know what the dandy house looks like. It's 171 years old and it looks like any time now, if you push it hard enough, it's going to fall over. For sure. Though Dan has done a lot of stuff to it here here within the last series of years, yeah. He's busted his butt. They say when they remodel those houses, it's not uncommon for more activity to occur, though, which is interesting. No, it's true. The only thing that regarding remodeling is that he put a roof on it. 
and you did put a new bathroom in. Uh, the floors are the same. They're the original floors from 1853. Uh, and I love the upstairs, but the upstairs barn boards are like that, or the floorboards are like this, and they're two in, over two inches thick. But the house is having a little trouble now in the kitchen, starting to get weak. And I worry about that because that's under the, uh, that's above the crawl space. There's no room to get under there and work. But that maybe that's an omen for us. Maybe that'll give me a reason to go in there dig and see if there truly are bodies in that crawl space oh man because that is another part of that story actually one of the things i was going to mention was supposedly mike and randy was out one evening they supposedly went back to all this stuff happening in the in the house now what i find interesting about that story is supposedly mike took randy back home and then he got into an accident yes Yes. Went to the hospital and it, he was in there for a while is the, the way I believe the show depicted it. Yep. He, uh, Mike had an old car that couldn't go 50 miles an hour downhill. It really was an old clunker. And the hill going up to the house, uh, Wagner Hill, was a dirt road and you couldn't get traction. I mean, and, and his car... He drove like an old lady anyhow. He really did. He was a young kid. He was very cautious. And after dropping Randy off, he was coming up the hill and he lost control of the car, but he he wasn't sliding or anything. He just lost control. Thank God he hit a tree because it's straight down uh, maybe 75 to 100 feet on that side of the road. And the farmer across the road from where he crashed was able to hang on to his car so it wouldn't go over all the way. Tree helped it too. But Rand, or Mike kept saying when the paramedics, when the ambulance came, there was somebody in the car with him. Please get them out. Now, he was unconscious saying this. And there was a, a, a an imprint of what looked like somebody's head hitting the windshield on the passenger side. There was nobody in the car with Mike. And he hit his eye, they know this, on the mirror, uh, the rear view mirror, and, and got slammed into the, the dashboard that way. He never went to the passenger side. But all the way to the hospital, he kept saying, get him out, get him out, and then get her out, get her out, get him out, get her out. Uh, he was in a coma for a while. And uh, Clara thinks, even though this happened in 73 and Mike just died two years ago, she still thinks and never would have thought this until the doctors, when they opened Mike up for his second accident, they found a previous injury that had released a blood clot. That was probably the main reason he died from the injury he got two years ago. She thinks the house killed Mike and was always after him anyhow, which it seemed to be because Mike didn't like the house. Mike would, Clara didn't know this, Phil didn't know this, his, his siblings did, but he would sit in his room and just swear sometimes at the house how much he hated it there because he didn't like seeing what was what, young. Yeah, but he didn't like see what was going on with his siblings or his mother yeah. because Clara was tough. She wasn't afraid for herself, but she was afraid for the kids. Ah. They said that the house, it's not necessarily even the house, the property. No, it's the land too. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's a, a, like a little pond there, correct? Yeah. That was put in just prior to the dandies moving in. Now, let me throw this at you. Even though Father Alphonsus, who did the exorcism in 74, he was contacted by a priest Sometime, don't know the date. I, all I know is that he, he explained it to me too. Sometime in the interim between 70 and 75, a priest from Buffalo, New York, 70 miles away, contacted him and said he had done, done a house cleansing in the 20s, in the 1920s, on the same house. Now, that's the McMahon family owned the house for about 75 years. Then there were, uh, there were only, if I'm, if I have my 
research correct, there were three different people that owned the house. Well, only two actually before the day or before the McMahon family moved in. Uh, the Ever Brothers built the house and the house next close nearby that we hope to find in June. And then they sold it to Burton, a Burton gentleman. He sold it to Michael McMahon in 1861. So from 61, with a little bit of time in between my someone else living there, until 69, eight, 1969, 1861 to 1969, the McMahon family owned that property. Which takes us back to what you said earlier, which also came out in that story. There's a lot of rumors that there was the two, I believe they were brothers. Everett, Everett brothers, Charles and Michael. I will say that that's a very um, controversial thing because there's a lot of people that said, no, it never happened. There's a lot of people that believe that it did happen because the way the story goes, and I don't know how true it is, there was a road that went through there that stagecoach would typically take. And people would supposedly get off there and those two brothers would rob them, kill them, and then bury them somewhere on the property. Is is they said the crawl space, but I don't know if they're talking about what's downstairs. Well, I I, I can sum that up, I think, pretty easily. Alex Tannis, the world-renowned psychic who assisted Father Al in the exorcism, he came to the house twice, once in 73, once in 74 to do the exorcism. In 73, he came there and he gave his, he walked through the house with Father Al and he gave his readings, his impressions of what was there. Seven spirits that the house had, may have been an inn at one time and the innkeeper would rob and kill the people on the stagecoach. I find no history of a stagecoach going through there, none. And we've, re we've extensively researched this. But now we have conflicting reports on that too. Because a gentleman that was uh, married to the last McMahon family member, John O'Brien said when he visited the house to meet Dan four or five years ago, where's the road that went behind the house and around the side of the hill? There was a road that went behind the house, but it didn't go anywhere. It was a tractor road. And I found that out, thank God, from a previous tenant who lived there just before the dandies. And I knew the whole family, but didn't know they lived there. Uh, Charles, and he'll be here in June also to add to more of our clarification of all the rumors. So I don't know about the stagecoach. We based our books on Alex Tannis's findings his psychical findings as far as the stagecoach, the murders and all that. But both Everett brothers were the first ones to live there. They had families, they had children, both of them did. One lived in the dandy house, one lived in the other house they built, which is close by. They sold it to Burton, not, not much longer, I think it was 18, I think we have to find exactly four years that we're missing in the history. Because I've got the tax rolls rule in that house. And we've got a four year gap. So maybe there was somebody there who could have been doing these heinous things that, that even Alex found out about. We don't know, Bert. Now, when that psychic went through there, was you there when he was there for that also? Because I know you was there for the exorcism. He came in, he was doing a, uh, a lecture on uh, psychic phenomenon at St. Bonaventure University. And of course, Father Al wanted to grab him and take him to the house, which he did. He didn't know he was gonna go there. He asked him nicely, "Would you? could you go to a very troubled home in the area? And he said, sure. And now I know Father Al told him nothing about what was going on. But he, like I say, he, he, he had the impression of seven spirits we have seen seven different spirits by description on the property, not just us. And I've only seen two, not just the people there, but people who come by, their friends, 
neighbors up on the neighboring hill. So it's um, those two things were were kind of uh, proving he was right in both ways. Seven spirits, seven were seen. So we don't know. But as far as the stagecoach and all that, there's a four-year gap I can't find of who was in that house. But the McMahons did buy it in 61, but it was built in 53. And Burton only lived there for a year and a half, so I don't know where that other time went. Because the interesting thing was, and this is, a lot of people don't talk about this, at least in the research. I really only found two places that talked about it. All of that land was all clumped together at one point and was split up because they were trying to create hunting areas. Uh huh. Is that correct? Yes. So, because they tore down barns, right? That wasn't part of the foundation of the house from a barn? Uh, they tore down one barn that the McMahon family owned uh, just prior to putting the pond in. And again, that barn wasn't exactly where the pond is now. Uh, part of the barn is in the bottom of the pond. And we do have a new foundation we, that they started digging up that we hope to finish digging up this, this June. My God, only 16 days from now, actually. And it looks like there's a slate. It's a flat piece of something in the bottom of this foundation, which is shaped like a triangle. So we're going to drill a hole, stick a camera down through, an endoscope type camera. If we find something, that's all coming up. And there are, there are what looks to be, according to ground penetrating radar, graves on the property. But they're not McMahon memories. Now, now, back in the old days, people used to bury their, their kinfolk on their property. We have the graves of every McMahon family, that every McMahon member who was in that family from 1861 on. We've got their grave sites. They're not buried there. A lot of research, a lot of research has gone into this, Bert. A lot of research. And this is what I always talk about when we talk about research. I wish I would have found Paul before I did my initial podcast because there was a lot of information that wasn't provided to me that I wished I would have known because it would have changed my entire perspective of how I would have created this podcast to begin with. Again, the podcast I created was a great story, but the story means less to me than the accurate story, which is what means the absolute most, in my opinion. The truth is always scarier than the fiction that we can write. It, it can be. It can be, Bert. Yeah, absolutely, it can be. Uh, but you did a... In, in your presentation, in everything that you said, I, I gave it an A-plus either way. Whether the information was wrong, because how are you going to know? How would you know what was exactly correct, what was accurate, what was maybe accurate, same with the, you had mentioned um, the the uh, Native American uh, burial up there or the Native American uh, skirmish. There is nothing in the history books. Now, I, I went along with the Native American idea too. But now that I've done the really strong, hard research, why would they live on top of a hill? The Native Americans needed water for their crops, for their cattle, for their transportation. They're not going to live way up on a dry bed hill. They're going to live down by right there in Hinsdale. They got the Allegheny River going through, the Ishaway Creek. They could use both of those. But what you did was excellent, like all of your podcasts are. Well, I definitely appreciate that. We try. Delivered fantastically. I wish I had your your patience to do it the right way. Because you know, you've seen me on my channel. People think I'm nuts. <laughs> no. Paul just likes to have fun. That's the key. Paul and I have well, had very too. similar paths, you know, and that's what this is all about. But this is why communities like ours have to stick together because we're yeah. all in the same fight. That's a thing. There's too much animosity that happens in this community, which I hate it so much 
because we're all valuable tools. Now, that being said, there are some people that I believe hurts the cause and those that are trying to create entertainment versus what's real. And that's what makes it kind of tough sometimes. That entertainment's okay if they just let their viewers know this is for fun. Not all the stuff that you see is truly happening. Uh, I've had my my share of opinions and my share of conversations with some of them. And some are very straightforward and say, you're right, you know, but they still aren't posting out there. We do this for entertainment. I believe every channel should have a disclaimer. This yeah. is for entertainment purposes only. Then what would my disclaimer be? Because I still, we still act the clowns, especially at the house. My God. Yeah, but there's a, there's a difference though. You're creating entertainment, but still providing accurate stories. Like the stories that we've had today, when I, when I piece this together, and if you guys have not watched the podcast that I'm going to create around this, you're going to want to go back and see it because the story that's here is an amazing story. The way that you explain something in the very beginning, I'm like, this is podcast gold because it's a real story of what happened and that's where the value is but part of it is you're just as much attached to that property as even clara and her family is at this point because you've been there so long even after they've left yeah you're what i would call a curator of the property you've kind of you've kept the story alive and that's why it's so mm -hmm. important that we get your story out you know, my podcast, the problem with my podcast is I hit a story and then I move to the next one. You're creating a legacy. I'm just creating an avenue, a doorway in. And this yeah. is why everyone needs to check out pa Paul's channel because for the stuff that I can't even dive into, like you said, we would be sitting here for hours at a time telling story after story after story. Obviously, People on my channel, you can't do that. That's why you got to go to Paul's because Paul, Paul's is going to be able to provide those stories that we just can't fit into one podcast, unfortunately. Now, that said, Paul, is there any stories that you think is entertaining that maybe I didn't even cover in my podcast that's real, real stories? There's, there's a few here. Sure. And Link is another one. I'm going to try to get Link on here because, yeah, Link, he's <laughs> you know, we talk we talk about all these dandy houses and all the dandy things. I think the stories even occur after that has stopped. And prime example, Paul's had experiences. We talked about one of his experience. I know Link, which is, I'm going to call it Paul's co-host for his show. Uh but Link has some great stories, and Link has such a great personality. I'm going to try to sweet talk him into coming in. I don't, oh, he'll, I don't he'll, know he'll what I got to bribe him with. Maybe some chocolate chip ice cream or something. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure <laughs> what we're going to. No, that'll work. That chocolate, any ice cream will work, and he'll he'll eat it upside down like always. Uh, Link, yeah, he's he's he is a, a, a co-host of the channel now. Uh, I met him. It'll be four years ago. He thought. Dan Class, who owns the house, has static cameras up. He used to live stream, just watching, you know, dead air, see if anything happens in the house. And I would turn, you know, tune in once in a while and say hi to people because I, you know, they know who I was. Well, I did it one night. Link was in there watching the stream with a couple of his friends. And I said something, you know, and my name popped up. He said, wait a minute, Paul Kenyon, did you write the book that I just read? Is that you? I said, what did you read? And he said, well, don't tell me. You know how excited he is. Okay, you know how excited he gets. Yeah, he read that book. This is the book, folks. This is the one you guys got to get. I'm, I'm going to put on Amazon. We need to get Paul some, some do re mi fa -sa -la -di da You know what I'm saying? <laughs> this is the book. And my second book will be out in August. I'm, the I'm excited book. about that. I got to get past page 50 in this one. <laughs> you know, I could, you know, honestly, I, I can't even tell you where in the book it's the most exciting. So far, it's good. The The thing I like about yours is it's at least up to page 50. I, I'm going to assume that all of it's going to be the same. But when you read Paul's book, it, it comes, it feels like it's wrote by an, uh, someone actually telling a story. It's not wrote by someone that's, 
I think too many books has the appearance of being very matter of fact. Your book is more like a narration is the best way I can put it. Well, but what, what everybody seems to tell me is that they feel like they're there when they read it. And right. I didn't, I did not write the story. And that's what I was doing was writing a story. I didn't write it to publish it. I wrote it to, you know, I said, okay, and I, it, all the way back in eighth grade, I was always wanting to be involved with writing stuff. My eighth grade teacher said, you need to write books or stories. I said, well, I'd like to. So all through high school, I did. And I decided after, after actually, I had my first 30 pages of the Danny House story written in 1974. And then I moved to Arizona with my family, with my brand new two babies. And uh, that went on the back burner. And so I finished the book. After I got back to New York in 99, because I wanted to write it for me. And, and it was 1,077 pages, Bert. It was twice that thick. It was this oh, wow. big. And I, I sent it to Clara. She said, I can't read all this crap. And so she did. And then she said, send that to my publisher. And I said, you're published. You mean publish a book? Me? Write a book? So I did, he accepted it. He said, well, please do me a favor, cut the damn thing in half. So I took a lot <laughs> out of this, but most of it was uh, about my band, about my life, about my kids. It wasn't about, uh, there was a couple things in the house I omitted, but they weren't that important, like picnics and things like that. But there yeah. was one thing that was important and I can't put it in now because it's all the way back to 73, but it's fun. I, I enjoy it. You know, I don't go to the house like I used to, but I'll be there for five days and we're live streaming every minute of every day that we're there. This is why you guys need to make sure that you follow Paul's uh, information. I'm going to put it all down in the description down below. He's got a Facebook page, YouTube page. He's also on the Twitter machine. Uh, you're definitely going to want to see those live streams. When you see him and Link together, it's an absolute blast. I have so much fun <laughs> joining his, and I'm on it almost every single time. I technically went in the first time just to try to, you know, uh, build that friendship because I could see we had the same goal in mind. We just had to harness that energy a little bit. It's the best way I can put it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But yeah, I, watching I, he and Link together has been a blast. I, I met him, like I said, in the chat in the chat then he decided i'm going to that house i want to go to that house and he did and he came up with with his his roommate uh scared to death because uh one of the neighbors threatened to kill him because they were walking on too close to his property and the guy's a wacko so don't don't uh, don't worry about that i mean he's he's not he doesn't bother anybody but uh so i met link and uh the second time he came I spent one of the nights with, I can't remember who he came with, but I spent one of the nights with him there. And we had a few things happening at the house, nothing major, uh, but we've had some crazy shit go on in that house. It's bad. We're sound asleep, we're live streaming. You can hear us throwing like a couple of water buffalo and suddenly you hear these steps coming up the stairs and there's nobody else in the house. My granddaughter was sleeping in the bed with me because she was only nine and she was scared. And we heard these steps coming up and then we have all the screaming going on. And then I see, a, well, what appeared to be, it could have been the lighting outside because it was two o'clock in the morning and the kitchen lights were shining under the ground. But all I could see was a half of a person. And I thought, what the heck is this? So we grabbed our flashlights, hopped out of bed, ran out into the pouring rain and found nobody, no footprints, no nothing. So you never know what's going to happen at this house. Now, we started down this path and we, we sidetracked a little bit. Is there any stories that you know that happened back in the 70s that would lead any kind of like, uh, not acceptance isn't the right word but would would be something that you would have found fascinating that happened in the 70s with the dandies as far as paranormal oh yeah which one do you want um i'll give you one of the major ones 
I so, went up. I went up to visit by myself, and they had a house full. Mike had a house full of friends, plus a new neighbor that had moved in, and uh, we all decided to hang out in the living room for a while. So Mike, being the young kid that he is, and had all these friends. He got a couple of cots, the old army cots, and they were spring loaded. They had so they were comfortable. And there, I can tell you, everybody was there. Jim Sushi was a photographer. Mike Murray was home from the army. The guy had his upper, upper arms flex. His upper arms were the size of my thigh, and um, he was a monstrous kid. But uh, Jim Sushi, Mike Murray, Mike Neff, Mike Dandy, Randy Carr, and Keith Michael, and myself. We're all sitting there and having a good time. Uh, Phil, Phil was gone. Claire was upstairs with the girls. Beth was in her bedroom, right off the living room. You know, we're all just having fun talking about my band, my rock band, what songs we did, and all this other stuff. And it was snowing out, and I thought, well, I'd better keep an eye on it because it snows bad on this hill. So I'll set up the scene for you. Uh, I'm on a cot. There's two cots facing the kitchen, lined up with the kitchen. I'm facing the window behind me, which leads to the pond. And Keith Michael was laying on the other one facing the kitchen. And Jim Sushi, the photographer, was on the couch. Mike Murray, the building man, he was on a little thing on the floor. And Mike, that, Mike Neff, Mike Dandy were on the floor. And Randy was over in Phil's chair. And... I'm sitting there and I went out, I went out in the kitchen, got a glass of milk and I sat down. Randy was sitting in Phil's chair. So I turned on the cot and I'm drinking a glass of milk. All of a sudden I went up ever so slightly. I just went, I just, so I looked down the cot to see who sat with me. There's nobody there. I said, you want a glass of milk? And then Randy went into a trance, which he was able to do. Instead of going through all that, I'm going to take you to the main part of what's going on here. I went outside and actually Clara told me, you're not going home tonight, Paul. I said, yeah, I got, okay. I, yeah. Thanks for saying that, Clara, because I really got to go. She said, you're not going nowhere. I looked out the window, couldn't really tell in the front, the front yard. So I opened up the back door and the snow was already about that deep. I said, no, because this is on a steep hill. So I ended up getting stuck there for the night, which I didn't want to. And that was my first night ever staying in the house. So I'm on the cot and I'm now facing the window, the, the same, the, the back. And Keith is laying on this one next to me, facing the kitchen. And Jim Sushi still lounged out on the cot or the couch. I'm laying there with my hands up and I had a really big puffy pillow under my head. And I'm looking at the window and I'm looking at the, the snow on the tree. There was a moon, so you could see outside, plus the snow is bright. And I'm looking at the window and I seen a little movement. And I thought, well, now it's going to get windy and start blowing it around. And I see the movement, but I see something else moving with it. And all of a sudden, plain as day, a woman's face comes to the window. And she's just staring straight at me. Her face is plastered almost on the window. She's staring at me and I got the sudden feeling of, I know this is going to sound weird. I got the sudden, it wasn't a voice, but I got this, I'm going to kill you. I mean, that's all I, that's all I got. I, what the hell, where'd that come from? So I got up, I didn't say a word to anybody. Everybody in the room was still awake. I didn't say nothing. I just got up. I said, I'm going home. I don't care what the roads are like. I'm going home. And Mike Dandy said, you can't go. And Mike Murray grabbed my my ankle and said, you're not going away with those roads the way they are. Right at that moment, I was right at the entrance to the kitchen, which is connected to the living room. Beth came out of her room screaming. There's a, win a woman in my room, hysterically screaming. And then when she came out of the room, you could smell this pungent, very very strong perfume, probably lilac, or not lilac, but gardenia. I can't stand the smell of gardenia. And it just whiffed after her. And then Phil or Clara comes downstairs. What the hell's all the ruckus? So 
That happened that night. And she described the woman after she calmed down, the same woman, I mean, I could only see her face, but the same description, which could be coincidental, as the woman at what was in Beth's room. Because she was moving that way from the window. She didn't turn. She her, her head, I'm looking at her, and she's going that way like she's walking sideways. That's crazy. That whole house is crazy, but it's so nice up there. You see me live on my live stream when I go alone. Yeah. So quiet. So quiet. Well, I believe it was Claire herself that said she loved the property. She loved everything about the way yes. the house was, the way it yeah. looked. And that's the thing. To hear Clara, or at least what I've heard Clara have said about the residence is that that would have been her forever home. She loved it there. Yeah. It would have been everybody's except Mike. Mike didn't like it. I don't think Beth did either because she was, like I say, she was 16. You know, she's getting to that age where you got to hang out with your friends and, you know, find out what boys are all about. But living up on the top of the hill with nothing going on, you can't do that. Um, one other story I'll tell you that that uh, sure convinced the hell out of me. I could have no more doubts no matter what's going on. We had a picnic Labor Day. Father Al was there, I with Debbie, uh, the whole family, a couple other friends. Clara used to have these picnics where if there was a birthday, she'd have everybody's name on the cake. That's what we're doing June 22nd, just to follow her tradition. And I stopped and got a couple of gallons of milk for Clara, asked her if she needed anything. She told me, so I got it. When I got there and walked in the kitchen, Beth or uh, Laura and, and Claire were in the kitchen, and Claire is just bouncing back from counter to sink to table. To I said, what's going on? She said, it's bad. It's bad. It's a bad day. I said, well, what's wrong? She said, it's just, you can feel it. So I just did my thing. And then I looked at Laura, and Laura's glasses were kind of thick, and she was a she was a special child. She had learning disabilities, but she was the sweetest little girl. I loved her to death. And she was my barometer. I looked to her every time when I came to the house. And she looked at me over the top of her glasses like, be careful. I knew it. I knew it. So I'm, I'm just helping out with whatever, going outside, taking stuff out to the table. And... We expected to stay till six or seven o'clock that night and then go our separate ways. But it broke up about three o'clock in the afternoon because even Phil was agitated. Everybody was agitated. Debbie and I, we, uh, we, we got ready, we went home. And about, I think around eight o'clock that night, 8.15, Father L called, which was a surprise because he only called me once. And we were talking for a minute and then he cut me off and said, uh, would you go back to the house with me? I said, why, what's wrong, Father? He said, all hell is broken loose. I said, well, yeah, I guess I'll go with you. I felt weird that he asked me that. I said, you want me to meet you up there? He said, no, 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 I'll pick you up. I'm gonna take a sip so you can cut this part out. My throat's going to hell. So he picked me up in in short time and we drove up to the house and when we got on Union Street and only in, which is the main drag, he asked me if the house was, if I could feel the house calling him or, or calling me if I could feel the house. Sense, some, some sense that I needed to be there. And I, I, I was thinking, what is he talking about? But then I thought about it before, or thought about how I was feeling before. And occasionally this would happen. I would have this sudden urge, I gotta be at the house. And it plays with people that way. But we drove up and we didn't talk much on the way up there. Um, I'm, I'm actually trying to remember everything. We really didn't talk much. When we got to the house, we pulled, he pulled around the back at, at the time, the yard isn't the way it is today, and you park almost even. You park even with the door, the back door, which leads into the kitchen. 
When he got out, I got out, the passenger side, which is away from the house. I looked at the house. I looked at the top windows, which is Laura and Mary's bedroom. And I saw Clara, so I waved to her. And she waved back. And then Clara came around the corner as my hand was still in the air. Clara and, and Phil, because Phil didn't go to work because it was so bad. He came around, they came around the corner. I said, well, that's not you. And she said, no, they're everywhere. You walk around the house, you look in the bathroom, there's a girl. You go in the house, which is a very short run from the back door. There's nobody in the room. And then you see them outside. It was a bounce back and forth for the next couple of hours. They were just spirits everywhere. So it was almost like a mimic is the best way that I could mm -hmm. probably define that, where it takes the appearance of somebody else. And I heard, I can't remember who I heard say it, me. But they had a very interesting theory that if a spirit's pulling from someone's energy, they can take the appearance of that person. Elemental. Yes, elemental. Yep. Yep. Clara, Clara now believes that's what's going on up there. After all these years, doesn't make very sense what's going on up there. Now, typically when I do these podcasts, I always like with a start, which we've done, we've kind of went into the events that occurred. What was kind of what I would call the ending part of the story or, or obviously I know you was there for the exorcism. Can you go into the exorcism a little bit and then kind of explain what happened with the dandy family to the point to where they moved out? Alex Tanis came back with a film crew of seven people from NYU on April 13th of 1974 to finally perform a house cleansing, simple exorcism to see if they could relieve the family of their problems. We were told to leave. I was already there at the house and I was told to leave for a couple hours. So Alex could go through the house and get a, get his bearings on what's going on, who might be there. You know, it's, <laughs> I, I found that funny because a, a psychic walking through trying to, Okay, what spirits are where? You know, I, I just found that kind of silly, even though I've already had my experiences. We came back. I don't remember the exact time. It was already early evening when the, when the exorcism was performed. And I was sitting in the doorway of the kitchen to the living room with two of the crew members, because they didn't have anything to do as far as the filming or recording. So we were sitting in three chairs, really trying to angle them so we could all see the, the entire uh, ritual going on. Father Al was, was saying a simple exorcism, the, the Roman ritual. And just as he was, well, first of all, we thought we heard somebody coming down the stairs. We could hear the steps coming down and we're right next to him. We're just a couple feet away. And you know, this guy who was closest to the stairway is pushing into me because he's scared to death, which I was anyhow. But we didn't know what, what we might see, but that stopped. In midstream, it stopped in the middle of the stairs. Just as father was, was finishing the prayer, a cross between a cat and heat, uh, a, a baby screaming and a banshee just filled every room. It wasn't coming from anywhere. It was everywhere. No matter where you, you turn your head, you're hearing it there. You look in the behind us in the kitchen, it's there. You look in the living room and lean that way. It's it's everywhere, but nowhere at the same time. And father had continued. He only had a couple of more sentences, I, I do believe to say. And when he ended, we started talking and the, the guy with headphones on over my best room said, stop, shh, 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 it's still going on. But we couldn't hear it. And when we looked at that guy, he looked like he was going to get sicker than a dog. Like like he was, he looked pale, uh, scared to death. So I, I wonder, did he hear something else besides that wailing? And I never, I wouldn't have the, I wouldn't have the reason to ask him. That thought wouldn't be in my mind to say, did you hear something else? I wish somebody had asked him that. 
At this point, I'm 20. I'm not quite 22 years old. The next day, I'll be 22. They did this the day before my birthday. And after, after the exorcism, everybody broke up. Clara got up off her knees and pissed and moaned that they hurt so bad. <laughs> she really did. So, oh my God, I'll never do that again. But uh, Alex was in the kitchen with Father Al and Clara and some of, some of the crew. And I had to go out in the kitchen and I was going to go to the refrigerator and I put my hands, Alex had his back to the stairway, which, and that bothered me to go by that stairway every time. But I put my hands on his shoulders. And if you take a balloon and rub it on your shirt and then put it by your hair, it'll pull your hair up. That's exactly what I felt when I put my hands on his shoulders. I felt that static. And it wasn't his clothing. It was him. Uh, the man had a gift from, I, I don't know what it was, you know. Because I didn't really believe in these people that say, oh, I can tell your fortune or I can tell you about your family. Get out of here. But some people are gifted. We were in the kitchen or in the living room. I went back in and I was talking to Mike and uh, one of the other guys. And I, I said, Mike, I, I don't think this is gone. I still feel that, that goosey that I get. And Jan Kahn, who was leading this, seven man crew from NYU said to me, will you say that tomorrow doing, during the interviews? I said, no, I, I, who am I? I said, you got this big psychic out here and father, I, I'm not gonna, you know, go against what they think they fixed. And, but she still cornered me. She still cornered me with the question she asked the next day. Father Al did not show up the next day. He did not come. And I didn't know until 1999 why. This happened in 74. He told me in 99. We kept in contact. There are many letters of my personal letters that I wrote to him in his archives. And I had the nerve to sit down with him on a park, on a bench outside the rectory one day, just chit-chatting about my cab company. I used to cater to the university took care of all the students on their drunk runs that they did every weekend. And I I just said quietly, we're both facing the parking lot. We weren't looking at each other, just talk, talking, you know, chatting. And I just said, Father, why didn't you come the next day? And he didn't look at me because I could see him out of my corner of my eye. I was waiting for a response and he just said, very quietly because I know it didn't work. The man, if you were, if, if anybody and anybody can to certain, a certain extent, go through his personal archives, his, can't go through his private archives, but some of his personal public archives you can go through at the university. If you were to go there and look at his scan through his archives, your head would melt. The man was 50 years ahead of everybody when it came to uh, paranormal psychology, uh, paranormal research, psychic phenomenon, voodoo, black magic, witchcraft. He was the king. And he had the answers to all that stuff. And I think Rome looked to him quite often for answers from from him about especially exorcisms. Um, I didn't spend enough time with him. He died in 2005. And in, from 99 when I moved back here until 2005, I only visited him about 10 times. But he was a private man too. He, he appreciated his privacy. But I still should have grabbed him, took him home to dinner, talked about everything but the house because I think he was reluctant in telling me anything more than what I experienced with him while being at the house. But what a man, what a, and he's a class, he was a class clown because when Claire was having all those, all those problems with trespassers, he came up there, he stole a light from security off the university, a blue light and a hat, a cop hat. And he was chasing people off the property in his own car. 
Now, my understanding is based on what I had found on the story anyway, is that he obviously did what he was able to do or what he saw fit to do with the exorcism. But there was one more event that happened with, especially with Claire. And she's like, we got to move. Is that correct? Yeah, the, the main thing that was the straw that broke the camel's back for Clara, for Phil, mainly Phil, was, it you know, after the exorcism, things had calmed down for a couple of months. You're going to hear everything from three weeks to three years, but it's a couple of months. And it started to ramp up again. And it was just the typical things, the noises and the, the slamming windows when there's not any windows open or the whispering. That's the one thing in this house. You can be alone. There's no neighbors anywhere. And just suddenly you hear whispering and it's close enough to you. You know, they're there right close. But the 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 thing that clinched it for, for Phil, <coughs> he walked upstairs. And I'm so sorry, I can't remember the name of the book. It's in Clara's book. He walked upstairs as he rounded the corner to go into his bedroom. They had a little bookcase over on the, the, the large wall. And there was a book sitting in front of it, floating in the air. And it dropped. <coughs> and opened to a specific page. And I can't remember the top of my head right now. And that was enough for Phil because he just couldn't take it anymore. And when they went to bed the last night in the, in the house, they were hearing everything from <coughs> sirens to gongs to every kind of noise possible coming from the basement, which I don't understand that. I even asked her, I said, Clara, were you sure you really heard that much nonsense? And she said, yes, we did. And I don't know why, but I, when they left, when they left, it was, it was like I lost a friend I'd known from childhood. And Clara said it was so far. She couldn't turn around and look at the house when they were driving away. But I'll, I'll bet you that house was looking at them. I guarantee it was. And nobody moved in for a while. Now I know we talk about the house and the property and we talk about there are neighbors nearby. Do they have any experiences in their home or is it just that house that those experiences are occurring? No, the, some of the neighbors have had, uh, there was a one gentleman, Harry, Harry. Wow. Uh, he had a, I don't know why, but he had a, a crucifix above his garage door. I think, I think, what did I, I think I said something to him. He said that because every time I leave, God's watching me leave or Jesus is watching me leave. And when I come home, he's going to bless my car. I said, well, that's cool. And okay. Wow. Uh, but he had, and the crucifix was tacked in the wall with a screw at the top through a little uh, hasp on the top of his crucifix. He went out one day and it was upside down, but it was still hanging off that screw. I said, "How? well, what do you mean? Because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of it logically. You got a little hasp on the top of the crucifix holding onto a screw, but when he came out, it was upside down holding onto the screw. He said, Paul, I don't know, but the hasp and everything was put on the bottom and it was upside down. I, wow. I don't know, is that spirits? But people have seen a boy who was killed in 1942 in a buzzsaw accident on his own property, um, just a, a, maybe a mile and a half from the house. We used to help the other farmers. They see the description of him, and we've seen him walking through the fields, walking down the road. And then when you go to look at him again, he's gone. That probably goes back to the story that I think the A Haunting had mentioned that it was, I believe Mike and Randy was going somewhere 
and they ended up in the woods and they saw a boy, but I think they said half his head was missing or something. I think oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, that story. they probably, one of them, Randy, Mike or Clara may have told them about the story of uh, Alfred, em- Alfred Warren Emerson, who was killed in a buzzsaw accident. And they probably turned it into somebody in the woods because he, he was yeah. injured on his own property and died three hours later at Cuba Hospital. So, yeah, they they twist and turn things on TV to make us more excited. You know, the, the one thing that I want to take away from this moment, and I want to thank you so much for coming. I know, obviously, this is a long one, and I know you're sick of telling a lot of these stories, but <laughs> you're... You're like the archives for many of us. We're, you're the absolute archive. You are the OG for most of us. For anyone that might listen to this podcast after that's creating another podcast, because this story doesn't die, obviously, with me or anyone that's no, done it before. What's the most common thing that is told that is absolutely incorrect that you hear over and over again? And the second part of that, the second ca- caveat to that, I'm going to tell anyone that's watching and everyone knows I'm a very fun loving. I'm a good guy. Do not screw with Claire and the family. Claire's still around. My big thing is here. If I, if I catch wind that someone's saying something against the family, I'm going to have issues myself personally. So is there anything that, that Clara has mentioned that's bothered her that was said to where we make sure that we kill that in this podcast so that those things don't go forward? Uh, there's a lot of misinformation she's upset with, including, but not so much pertaining to her family, Warren Emerson, that he died uh, from a bus saw accident on the Danny House property. He did not. He was injured on his own property. And Rome is the area. What bothers Clara the most is she, and she doesn't watch too many YouTube videos, but she's caught a couple that are conjuring Mike up. Mike will not go back to that house ever. Mike, she doesn't want his name used in the house. Uh, Come on, Mike, are you here? Come and talk to us. He would never go. Laura would. God, they they tried to conjure up Mary. Mary's still alive, lives a couple miles from Clara. Um, Trying to think of what really makes her mad. God, the the only way I can, and she just says, I wish people would listen to you. You're the only one that knows our story. Um, Yeah. Mike, there was four in the family, four children. Because you know that, the, even the, the Discovery Channel, they showed two wrong names. Right. Wrong name. Correct. And they didn't say leave, Mike, leave uh, Beth's name out. Call her Beth. They call her Tina. I can I can tell you all out there, too, if you're doing research, I found Clara and Claire. And Claire doesn't exist. So even I got that wrong. So it's Clara only. So if you find research that says Claire, that that's that's not correct. Yeah, she's got the same name, name as my mother. She had, my mom's name was Clara, Clara Grace. I don't, I can't remember Clara's middle name. Ha! Huh. But uh, that, that's the main thing. That's really the the only thing. And then of course the just telling her story straightly. Uh, and I know from my research, my podcast, there was some things that you corrected on mine. Since I'm going to be taking it down uh, so we can put this podcast up that has correct information in it, I'm going to correct some of the things that I know is incorrect. Uh, one of them is I talked about a fireplace that, that was in the property. You just, yeah, but you re, you, you related that to the Discovery Channel. There's no fireplace. There never, never was. At least not to my knowledge, unless they hit it in the wall and the walls aren't too thick. The crawl space, there is an open area under the kitchen, but even Alex Tan has said, they put the dead bodies in the crawl space 
above the kitchen. Because if you're going up the stairway, you can see into another crawl space. Is, is that correct? No. No. Oh, there's not. Okay. No. But the Discovery Channel had a crawl space under the stairs. It was huge. The only thing under the stairs is the basement. You know, it's just the regular basement. You can't see a crawl space anywhere. Now, one of the things that I've heard you correct, uh, listening to your streams and obviously being a part of this community now, um, in which again, check out Paul's channel. It'll be in the description down below. One of the things that I hear you oftentimes correct when we're talking about the the residents and stuff like that is a lot of times you mentioned during the exorcism, it's almost like the entire house collapsed in on itself is the best way that like it was rumbling and shaking and all kinds of stuff. That was, I believe what we would call Holly weirding. <laughs> that didn't exactly happen that way. Um, Usually, almost every everyone that tells a story says the house shook. The house didn't shake. I was sitting right in the kitchen doorway. The house was solid as can be. It didn't shake. Now, luckily, I didn't fall for that one. <laughs> I didn't put that one in mind. Thank goodness. I got enough stuff wrong. That's more entertainment, but uh, when you think about it logically, do you really think a house, a whole entire house is going to shake from an exorcism? I just don't think that would happen. Even if it were able to, it would be a very hard task. But no, the house, there was no, the, the screaming was going on. As they all say, the house was screaming and the whole house shook. Omit the house shaking. It didn't shake. Is there anything else you want to tell the, the community that you think is pertinent to your story or the Dandies family? Not necessarily, except, you know, if you do have a question and it's important to you to find out, just contact me. And if I know the answer, which I most likely will, I'll tell you. But if you hear that, you know, there's there's uh, uh, 13 people that drowned in the pond, how many were kids? Nobody has ever drowned in that pond. It's only been there since 70. It's been there for 55 years. Um Nobody's ever drowned there. Nobody ever hung themselves in the house. That's another one. That's another one that gets Clara get mad. Um, and that's a that's an extension of a story. I once told somebody that one of the former tenants, one of the former tenants, who was the brother of one of my roadies for my rock band, uh, who lived there. He, he was showing his siblings how they used to hang themselves in the West or how they hung people in the West. He tried it with a belt, but he couldn't get it off his neck. So right away, that little prank he was showing to his siblings turned out to be somebody hanging themselves in the house. The story, what, what are they called? Chinese whispers. That's what that's called. <laughs> Paul is what I would call an absolute storyteller. He is a podcast without having a podcast. I can tell you that much right now. And when you see his co-host link, you, you can't help but absolutely fall in love with both of them. They're, like I say, I came in just to kind of get into the community and I've absolutely fallen in love with the community. So if me being the one that you're listening to has fallen in love with the community, I know you will too. Paul, thank you so much for coming in. I definitely appreciate your time. I, I know how difficult it is for you to to do some of these things and re I guess the best word to, to put it, not like the exorcism, but regurgitate some of these stories over <laughs> and over again, but you're just such a vast vessel of knowledge. I love grabbing info from you for sure. That's only cause I was there bird. I mean, you'd be doing the same thing if you'd experienced something as, as crucial in, in somebody's life. And it will turn the house can turn a, a non-believer into a believer and I still have my, you know, where my skepticism is now is the stories that people tell me after they go to the house, because let me explain that really quick. I've been there, as I said, probably, well, I'm just going to say over 5,000 times, either visiting, opening for somebody or just relaxing, whatever. But I know what goes on there. And unless the spirits just simply stay away from me, which I don't, find that to be the case. I, I know the the ratio of crazy activity 
at least for me, uh, minor activity and absolutely dead silent. And I find the dead silence to be, I'll, I'll put this in, I'll put this in concrete from now on. Dead silence, 85% of the time. Creepy stuff, 10% of the time. Get the hell out, 5% of the time. Because there are times when you don't, and you know, you know when you go there, never been here before in your life, you can touch that doorknob and say, I'm not going in there. It's like it, it's like it, 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 it hits you with waves of something. I don't know, power, energy. I always think it's energy is what I always think. Yeah, because if I go up there and, and, and I, I feel fine in the driveway, by the time I reach that outside door to the porch, I'm going to know there. But if I touch the doorknob and get the slightest twinge, I'm not going in till whoever's coming there that I'm opening for to come in with me. And that's only happened Makes sense. 20 times, maybe 25. Wow. But once is enough. <laughs> <laughs> once is enough. Once is well, with enough. With Paul's permission, what I'd love to do is he put out a video. I'm going to put a little clip here, just a little little piece of it. You're going to have to go to his channel to see the full thing. But uh, Paul had, we're going to call it a little smell. He uh I smelled a little something. So with his permission, I'd like to put just a little small clip. If you want to see the full thing, you got to go to his channel. I'll again, put that clip down in the description down below. You're going to want to check it out, but thanks so much, Paul. I definitely appreciate it. I appreciate it, Bert. I, I, I appreciate you asking me to come by. We became good friends uh, out of my stupidity of yelling at you. <laughs> so water underneath the bridge. You did it for a good reason. Well, until we see you on to the next podcast, Goodbye. See ya. Don't forget, Zach Vegas went to, uh, he went to the same kind of school my ex-wife did for drama and acting and theater and all that stuff. Oh, my. Somebody come here. Now I wish somebody would. Ooh. Where's it coming from? Oh. Oh, my. Oh, my aching God. Oh, look at the chills on my freaking my, my legs are all goosebumps. Oh my God, there is the most strongest smell of perfume ring. Holy f me. Oh my God. Oh!